My name is Stephen Budd and uh, I live in London and you're here in my house right now in North London. I am a music entrepreneur and manager and I do a whole variety of things in the music world and spectrum. I manage artists, performing artists and uh, I also manage record producers and songwriters. I started some music festivals both here in the UK and in India. Co-founded and run with a team project called Africa Express, which is a musical collaborations project uh, between African artists and Western artists. I run a couple of quite big charity, music related charity events. One for Amnesty, which is called Give a Home. Before that, I'd put together all the War Child's Passport Back to the Bars shows. Everything I do is in the music related space. And the last thing is I have a festival at the Roundhouse called uh, One Fest, which we can talk about as well. A little bit of history of how I got to be here. My very first job in the music industry was when I was 15 years old, my first paid job. I was given five pounds to be a roadie, five pounds a day, to be a roadie for the band Motorhead. This was a very long time ago, all right? And I was the, a roadie at their very first gig the very first show which was at a place called The Winning Post uh, in Twickenham. And that came about because I had been aged 14, I'd been DJing in a pub in Kingston, which is where I kind of grew up, Kingston on Thames. I was a very young DJ, and uh, but I used to DJ every Thursday and Friday nights in this pub. I had long hair, I looked a little bit older than I was at aged 14. In this pub were these guys who had started on this free music festival, and I got involved in this free music festival. It was quite an extraordinary and very long story called the Watchfield Music Festival. This was a huge music festival that happened only one in Watchfield near Swindon. It was 50,000 people, four stages, no police, and a bunch of hippies running around running this thing. Aged 15, 15 and a half, 16, I was given the job of stage managing one of the stages at this festival and I had no idea what I was doing. But off the back of that I was offered this job to come and roadie for Motorhead at their first ever gig uh, with Lemmy. Did that and then I went on to roadie for a series of sort of punk bands around that time. Bands like X-Ray Specs and Teenage Jesus and Wayne County and the Electric Chairs and all sorts of people. So I, I sort of grew up through the roadie route, right? So I was the guy who was putting the, changing the guitar strings, putting up the drum kit at the beginning of the night, breaking it all down and the amps, putting them into the truck and then driving that truck to the next gig, except I wasn't driving because I was too young to drive, but driving that truck to the next gig and setting it up all over again. And I did that for, two or three years, learnt a lot about life on the road at quite an interesting time of the evolution of sort of rock and roll. Aged 19, I started a small little record label out of my bedroom at home. And this was putting out seven inch vinyl singles. So again, this was in a time before it was an easy thing to do. It was quite a complicated thing to do in those days. You had to go and find the artists that you really wanted to do, record them, get the masters pressed onto vinyl, get the sleeves made and get the labels made in the center. I did it all back, back to front, but I had to learn the hard way. And I used to get these records made 500 at a time, take them down to Rough Trade Records in Portobello Road. And Jeff Travis there bought all those records off me so that he could distribute them around the country and around the world. And that was the beginning of me getting more into the sort of business side of things. So I would release these records and then I would sometimes end up managing those artists because you had to do it all in one. And I didn't really understand what management was. All I knew was that we needed to find a gig for the band or we needed to you know, get them to the gig and hire a van, or we needed to find a guy with a PA system and somebody who would mix it. So doing a little bit of everything, a little bit of everything. I look back on that as a complete blessing really, because I learned a little bit of how every little bit of the music business kind of fits together. And this is in the days before digital, so before downloads, before streaming, before the internet. Real old school, hard slog, analog, get on the road, go and do as many gigs as you can, create an audience the sort of hard way. There was also a lot of more simplicity back in those days because there wasn't 5,000 media outlets, there wasn't 10,000 websites you needed to reach, there wasn't 40 different streaming services or download services or, you know, pressing on like CDs and vinyl. And, you know, you just had to make records. You took those records to Radio 1 in the, if you're in the UK, you took them to Radio 1. If Radio 1 liked them, 
they played them. And if they played them, people were interested in what you were doing. It wasn't that complex, you know, you just had to make great music and put on great gigs. The music industry has become incredibly complex since then, changed dramatically. But that foundation of learning and doing it the hard way and making an incredible amount of mistakes and not really having teachers as such, other than having to watch other people do their thing and try and learn from them, was a real grounding for me. I had this little record label, I was managing artists. I had a little bit of success with one or two of the acts that I was managing, signing them to labels like Warner Brothers. Again, learning the hard way and then going out and touring, not just in the UK, but internationally over in Europe and then eventually to America. And I was still very, very young managing these bands, aged 20, 21, you know, so pretty young. But then aged 24, I had a bit of success with one of the, the acts that I was managing and, you know, success meant get them on top of the pops and have a hit single. That's what happened with a band that I had called the Big Sound Authority. A success that nobody really expected, but it, but it had happened through really just through hard, hard, hard work and clever marketing, to be honest, that I managed to put together and I have to take responsibility for that. And it was great. But at that point, I sort of veered off into another direction because I started managing record producers. I was lucky enough that the first person that I took on was a, a producer called Tony Visconti, who was David Bowie's producer. And in those days, record producers didn't have managers. So this was a groundbreaking thing. And I'd found my niche. You know, I'd found a niche that nobody else was really exploiting at that time. I went to run his recording studio, which was in Soho, which is called Good Earth Studios. It's now called Dean Street Studios. It's still there. I watched the master at work. This is a guy who produced more than 10 of David Bowie's albums and T-Rex and all sorts of people. And my office was behind the control room of the studio and there was a glass window between my office and the studio. It's a one-way glass window, so I could watch him working with the artist. When things would go a little bit strange, as they sometimes would, he would come in and come and have a chat with me, going like, how do I deal with this with this artist? And we would talk things through. And, and I learned so much about the art of record production and the art of working with record producers. And my role at that point was to go and find him the next project. And record companies weren't used to having a manager of record producers. They weren't used to it. So it was, a, it was quite a groundbreaking thing. But it worked because he just wanted to be in the studio. He didn't want to be going around and visiting all the record companies and hustling for the next gig and finding out what was, what was hot and what was not and then trying to sort all of that out. He just wanted to work, you know? My role with him was to go and sell his services to record companies and to artists. And again, that was something that hadn't really been done before on a, on a, on a sort of organised scale. And I was very youthful and rolled my sleeves up got stuck into it and then created a management company for other producers who also wanted that service. In the mid 80s, I'd heard Africa Bambata. I was like, he had this track called Planet Rock, right? Which was one of the really, the very first early hip hop tracks. Party people, party people, feel your get funky. Suicide and force, feel your get funky. The Zulu nation, feel your get funky. And I was obsessed by this and I wanted to go and find the guy who produced this. And I got on a plane and I went to New York to find Arthur Baker, who was at that time the king of New York, really. And he had produced this track. And I persuaded him to come get on a plane and never been on a plane before. <laughs> he didn't like flying. And I persuaded him to get on a plane and come to London. He came to London and I then set him up with a whole bunch of amazing remixes around different studios in London. He was one of my very first other clients apart from Tony and that really worked. And there's some amazing stories around that too about what happened when he came over the first time and the people that he brought with him from New York and all the mixes we ended up doing with all these wonderful acts that all got charged at top, top, top dollar. We were charging out the kind of money then that you, you could make a whole album for now. We would just charge for one remix. <laughs> it was like, those were the days when sort of, you know, there was a lot of money in the, in the music production side of the industry. And that's changed quite a lot actually on the producer side. First artist I had some big success with in the 80s was a band called The Big Sound Authority. They're a bit of a cult kind of soul band, but we had a big hit in the UK. 
There was also a band called The Sound, who were really quite popular, who've become a big cult band these days. They're sort of historically quite an important band. But later on, I went on to manage artists like Tanita Tickerham, Magic Numbers, Gang of Four, Heaven 17, all bands that you know, mean something quite a lot in the UK and international music scene of the 80s, the 90s and the 2000s. But I kind of got a little bit sick of doing the same thing again and again and again, you know. In 2000, the opportunity came to get involved with a company that was in the live music space and in fact owned the Barfly Club in Camden. And it was a small little company, but they moved into my offices. I had offices at that point in, in Primrose Hill, and they moved into my offices. And then I did a deal with them and became a director of that company. And then over the next four or five years, that company expanded dramatically. I had my artist management company, and I'd merged that with that business. They then started developing live music venues. And so we had the Barfly, but then they bought the Borderline and the Jazz Cafe and the Garage and a variety of music venues, opened up bar flies all around the country. It became quite a big popular company in the sort of indie music space. The artist management company, Supervision, which I started with Paul Craig in 1999, all of a sudden that started to take off because Paul hired a couple of amazing guys to work with him. And one of the first acts they brought in through the door was Franz Ferdinand. Straight after that, it was the Kaiser Chiefs. And that company started to grow and grow and grow. And then eventually, this group of companies, which was called Channelfly, floated on the stock exchange and raised quite a lot of money and eventually managed to morph into another company called Mama Group. And uh, they managed to buy um, Hammersmith Apollo, you know? So it all became quite sort of significant, you know? And I was just involved in this business and doing my thing. But they started festivals. They have the Love Box Festival, The Great Escape down in Brighton, which has become the industry meeting place, showcase event for young indie artists. And it's a really important music industry meeting and conference that happens every year. It's become very established. So all of those came out of that little grouping of people in Primrose Hill. A lot of the people who worked at that place have gone on to become quite sort of senior people in the music industry now, doing quite amazing things. But that gave me the taste for getting involved in live music. 2004, I wanted to try and find a mechanism that would bring the different parts of the businesses together. And this was during the first Iraq war. That was going on in the background. We'd seen some very distressing images of children getting wrapped up in this war. At that time I had two very young kids and you know so I was emotionally connected with children and I wanted to do something that would help the children in war zones. There was this fantastic charity called War Child, still is a fantastic charity called War Child, who was operating in those war zones, taking orphans but giving them safe haven and giving them education, keeping their education going in the middle of the war and basically, you know, doing some really hard stuff, not only in Iraq but also in Congo, Uganda, doing amazing work. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we could find a way to have all of our businesses do something for War Child. And I came up with this idea of putting on big artists playing in tiny little venues. Because our Barfly clubs were pretty small. They had only hold about 200 people. And you think, well, how's that going to make any money? Right? And the idea was people would buy a lottery ticket to be one of the 100 or 200 people to see major artists play in the tiny little venues. And I spent a year putting this together, the first one of these in 2004. And it took me the hardest thing was to persuade and find the first artist to agree to do it. At that time, one of the biggest artists in the world in 2004 was David Gray, who had had huge album success, selling millions and millions of albums. And I'd been knocking on everybody's doors and everybody had said, yeah, I love this idea. It's a great idea. Lottery ticket. Fantastic. Great. You know, we, it means we don't have to sacrifice any real ticket sales because, you know, we're just selling lottery tickets. It's cool. And um, I'd been to see MTV and they wanted to get on board and the Daily Mirror and everything. But I couldn't get any artists to say yes. And then I was at the In The City conference in, in Manchester. I saw the manager. I said, you said that David Gray was going to do this. Blah, blah, blah. I pushed him up against the wall. <laughs> And he reminds me of this every time I see him. He said, he's going to do it. He's going to do it, right? And when I got that one, then I could get everybody else. And within the space of six weeks, I had Craig David, Amy Winehouse, Elbow, The Cure, The Darkness. We put on 21 major artists playing in the Barfly Clubs in one week. And we raised hundreds of thousands of pounds for War Child through this lottery ticket mechanism. That gave me a real taste. I suddenly thought, you know, I love this. 
You know, I, you know, live music was the thing that most emotionally sparked me. So that was kind of got my juices flowing in that particular area. A couple of years later, I met this guy called Ian Birrell, who was a journalist, deputy editor of the independent newspaper. We were on our way, it turned out, to go and see Amadou and Mariam, their first show in London. So this is in like 2005. It turned out that he was a big lover of African music. As you can see by looking around my house, right, I'm a big lover of African music. Fella Kuti particular was the artist that led me into that musical adventure out of which I've never stepped out, <laughs> right? And just got deeper and deeper and deeper. But anyway, so we started talking about African music and the fact that African music had been put into this kind of box, right, called world music, it was very limiting. That summer had been the summer where um, Live 8 had been at Hyde Park. And Live 8 was a massive concert with Madonna, Pink Floyd, dozens of huge artists playing as a charity event to pressurise Western countries to drop the African debt because, as you know, many African countries have a significant level of debt to the West which is unfeasible and is actually hamstrung their commercial development because they're having to pay all this interest on the debt. So there was a big pressure, which was a good thing, to drop that debt. Right? However, this concert featured no African artists. And this concert was about Africa. And it was because African artists weren't viewed as commercial. They were viewed as world music or fringe. This was way before Afrobeat and way before artists like Wizkid or Davido or whatever had you know, raised their heads in the West years before this. The African artists who would come to play in the UK were incredible, but they would play at African-only events or world music events and we felt that this was kind of dismissing you know they're just great entertainers and great performers great musicians and they should be given a platform just like anybody else and why limit it and in fact when you expose young audiences to these artists they enjoyed it like it was amazing right but they weren't been getting that exposure it was like the music that your dad would listen to you know or your uncle you know your uncle dave you know or your worthy hippie cousin right it was not getting exposure outside of those circles and we thought this is it's time to change that. We, Ian was a good friend with Damon Albarn from Gorillaz and got us together and said, let's, you know, let's talk about this. And Ian had a good friend, Remy Kabaka, right, who's in Gorillaz. Several of us got started to think about, well, how could we, is there something we could do to change this attitude? And we thought, if we hook up Western musicians, English and American stars, together with African musicians and get them to perform together and get them to make records together. Therein lies the possibility of reaching a whole new audience. Imagine this, right? Imagine Beyonce is your favorite artist, right? And if Beyonce starts working with somebody you've never heard of, but Beyonce is your favorite artist and she's doing a duet with this artist, right? or producer, you want to know who that person is, right? Because if she's got that seal of approval, if she puts that seal of approval on it, right? It automatically brings kudos. Our idea was to get some of these big Western artists over to Africa, get them to experience what it was like to work with and see these people perform, see these African artists perform, get inspired by that, and then get them to work together and bring them to a whole new, new audience. So we went as an experiment, we took a bunch of people over to Mali in West Africa, Bamako, in 2006. And we took over Zane Lowe, who now runs, you know, Apple on the radio side. At that time was, you know, like kind of the main Radio 1 DJ. We took over some of the guys from The Roots, Martha Wainwright, Fatboy Slim, Damon Albarn. And we spent a week in Mali, in Bamako, working with these amazing Malian artists, people like Salif Keita, Amadou and Mariam, Doseku Kuyati incredible people who happened to be there in Bamako at the same time we were there. That was a wonderful experience. Then we came back and thought, well, what are we going to do? And we thought, well, let's put on a gig. And we put on a gig in this place called the Jam Club in Brixton. And we just invited musicians to be the audience. And the gig was, there was no rehearsal. It was like 10 or 15 artists, African artists and Western artists, putting on a show for like seven or eight hours. I kind of emceed it. People like Kano, Bashi. This is 2006, right? But with Amadou and Mariam, the Good, the Bad and the Queen, which is Damon Albarn's new band, they played their first gig there. 
with Paul Simonon, bass player of The Clash, on bass. Keziah Jones, you had Suede Massey, you had Gang of Four, all these amazing artists just playing one after the other. We were going like, hey, these guys need some African drums on it. Or like, hey, this, you know, these guys need a brass section or whatever. And like the audience was just filled with musicians. So they would just get up on stage and play. And this went on way into, it was an amazing, incredible event. And people were like, wow, you know, but it was just musicians who saw this. But in the audience was Emily Evis from Glastonbury. She runs the Glastonbury Festival and she invited us to come and do that on stage at Glastonbury that summer. So we went down to Glastonbury and we spent a couple of days wandering around stages going like, if you come to the park stage on Saturday night, right, at eight o'clock, bring your guitar, there's going to be some mad stuff going down, right? And we did that and everybody turned up and we ended up doing an eight, nine hour show, completely spontaneous, people going off into the corner to rehearse over there, people trying to put their headphones on and it's all on film and it was just one of the most magical events and that was really the birth of this thing called Africa Express. Since then over the last 10 years we've put together a whole series of incredible events. The UK, in Spain, in France, in Germany, all over the place. Probably the most interesting of those events or the two most interesting of those events were in 2012 as part of the Olympics. We got funded by the Cultural Olympic to take a train a 1970s British Rail diesel train. Put some carriages on the back of it, old carriages from the Orient Express and these old carriages. Gut the carriages, put in rehearsal studios into the carriage. And we put 80 musicians onto this train, 40 Western artists, 40 African artists. And I'm talking Bubba Marl, New Order, the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, the Noisettes, Paul McCartney, John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin, the Libertines. <laughs> and just this incredible array of artists, right? And just shoved them on the train and said, we're gonna do seven shows in seven nights. And we drove that train around the country, private hire, right, around the country. And we did seven shows. During the day, we would go and do pop-up shows in schools and prisons and factories. But each night we put on a, tr a show that we'd made up on the train. Right, so they'd rehearsed it on the train as we were going to the show. And we put on these like four or five hour shows, crazy stuff, and we made a movie out of it. And then we came out, the last show, we built a festival site behind King's Cross Station. And there we put on a festival for 20,000 people, which was absolutely, it was a beautiful sunny day and it was absolutely magical, absolutely magical. And everybody from Rocky Atreori to Fatimata Diawara, Amadou, all of these wonderful people, wonderful African artists got to play with these amazing big name Western artists. There's Paul McCartney, right, singing wing songs with Baseku Kuyati playing an Ngoni. Rocky Atreori, Fatimata Diawara dancing and singing with him, you know, this was big news. Right? It was a big deal. So it was that kind of scenario that really started to help break down the attitudes towards African artists in the West, right? And open things up a little bit. And then after these kind of events, these African artists were getting booked onto festivals like mainstream festivals, right? Not pigeonholed. So we've been doing that for the last, you know, 10 years. And it's been a really wonderful and engaging experience. Last year, we put together the Syrian orchestra and we found all the Syrian people who'd been in this orchestra, who were now living as refugees, some of them in refugee camp, um, dotted around the world, and we brought them together, and we headlined the Royal Festival Hall, put them together with all these African musicians, Paul Weller with Damon Albarn, and a whole variety of African artists, uh, Rashid Taha from Algeria, Baseku Kuyati again, and we headlined the Royal Festival Hall, we played the Pyramid Stage on, at Glastonbury on the morning of Brexit, when people came out of their tents went, oh shit, <laughs> and we were the first act to play, you know, and then we took them around Europe. That was an incredible experience. Made an album with them, um, and you know, we went to Mali again in 2013. We made an album in, in a week there. We brought over Brian Eno, Ghost Poet, Holy Other, Little Silver, a whole bunch of English American producers, and we spent a week making an album with 10 young Malian artists who hadn't been able to do anything because of the war, we discovered Songhoi Blues. I ended up managing Songhoi Blues. They were refugees in Bamako. Signed them to Atlantic Records in America, Transgressive Records over here, took them on tour all around the world, got them to the stage where they headlined the Roundhouse, Somerset House this uh, summer, sold that out, you know, and yeah, that's that that's what Africa Express is kind of about and it's been a wonderful and ongoing 
process. But again, after that, in 2010, I went to India. There I met an extraordinary young man called Vijay Nair. I'd gone to judge the Young Indian Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and he had won this award. I decided to go into business with him, and we set up a little festival in India as an experiment, taking Western musicians out to India and having not Bollywood, but Indian reggae acts, Indian festival called the NH7 Weekender. And we did that in Pune in India in 2010. That has gone on and now we're in 2017 and we're now in the eighth year of that and it's become the biggest rock festival in India. So I go out to India quite a lot, bring out big Western artists. Last year, I mean, the last couple of years we've had Mark Ronson, Flying Lotus, Subtract, Megadeth, The Wailers. All sorts of amazing artists have played this festival over the last few years and it's a, it's a real labour of love. So we're sat in front of a poster here of Fela Kuti and my house is a little bit of a shrine to Fela. There's lots of paintings of him and, and I collect all the old original Nigerian vinyl releases from the 1970s uh, and 80s. Because I think that, you know, he's one of the greatest musicians who ever lived. And he was born in Abiokuta in uh, Nigeria and of course lived in Lagos. Created with Tony Allen, his friend and drummer, Afrobeat. Okay, not Afro Beats with an S, Afro Beat, the original, right? And Fella was more than just a musician. He was a political activist. And uh, you may be aware that Nigeria had a series of quite brutal military dictatorships in the 70s and 80s, subjecting to the people to unbelievable corruption and control, quite brutal control. And Fella was the one person who was standing up and making a lot a lot of noise about the condition that the Nigerian people were being put through. He was a very unconventional man. He had a, a venue, a club in Lagos called The Shrine and he would play there several nights a week from maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night till 4 o'clock in the morning and thousands of people would come to this show and the authorities really didn't like him. Many of his songs were about the corruption of the Nigerian authorities, about the army, he had a song called Zombie, which really upset the Nigerian army to the extent that they went and raided his compound where he lived, burnt it down through his mother, his 70 year old mother, who was a very well known and respected Nigerian woman, and actually the first woman in Nigeria to drive a car out of the window, broke her leg, and she eventually died a couple of months later. He was thrown in jail hundreds of times. Fella. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say hundreds of times, hundreds of times, beaten brutally. His body was covered with wounds. His original name was Fella Ransom Kuti, but he changed it to Fella Anikulapu Kuti, which means uh, he who carries death in his pouch cannot be killed by man. But you know, he released something like 50, that's five zero albums, 50 albums. Each album would maybe have two or three songs on it. Those songs are 15 minutes long, right? Each one is a mini symphony, they're epic. Sometimes he doesn't even start singing till five minutes into the tune, right? And if you haven't heard Fella before, trust me, right? Go and listen, because it's extraordinary stuff. The music is just amazing. And, and in fact, you know, his legacy is come alive again over the last few years. His manager, Ricky Steen, fella died in 97. He died in 1997. He had 27 wives. There's so much more to tell about him that we don't have time, but, yeah, but you know, go and investigate it. But his legacy came alive. They made a musical about his life called Fella, um, which was on Broadway and in the West End in London and at the South Bank. The mu money for the musical was put up by Jay-Z, Will Smith and Alicia Keys. It won all sorts of awards. It was an incredible thing. And there's been movies made about his life, one called Finding Fella, which I think you should go and see if you haven't seen that. There's lots of stuff online to go and have a look at. But he was, he's the, to Africa he is what Bob Marley was to Jamaica. I've been in it for 40 years. Okay, so I did start when I was 15 years old. It would be unusual, I think, these days for somebody to start in the industry at 15. But I mean, realistically, there was no music business course. There was no music business books. There was no music business structure in that sense. Now all of that exists. So as you know, there are music industry courses all over the place in many colleges that, that people can attend. I've recently finished being the chairman 
of the Music Managers Forum. So I did a three-year stint as the chairman of this. This is an organisation we started in 1992. It's now 25 years old. And it exists in order to promote understanding about how the music industry works between different generations of managers, but also to campaign on topic that are current in the music industry. Like, what are artists getting paid for for streaming? What can we do about the rip-off secondary ticketing market that steals money from punters and gives them to kind of tout? How can we change that? Many other different subjects, and it runs education courses and all sorts of things. So there is this whole infrastructure now of, that people can learn the, the basics of music management and hopefully not have to reinvent the wheel too much or make the same kind of mistakes as we made back in the day. There are many opportunities for young people to enter the music industry. The thing that still drives everything is passion. If you've got passion and you've got real genuine passion for this business and a love of music, that is the thing that stains you through a lot of the knockbacks that you're going to inevitably get uh, because it is tough as hell. It's not a well-paid business. People are assuming that, you know, people who work in the music industry are incredibly well-paid. It was once upon a time, but, you know, it's, less, it's a lot less well-paid. I mean, if you get it super right, yeah, and like sell millions and millions of albums, you know, then it's possible to earn a lot of money. But it's not the same kind of level of income as people used to earn once back in the day. So a typical day for me is I am up and out and in my office, uh, which is my, my office is over in Camden. I'm deluged by email. I'm no different to anybody else on the planet. You know, it's an overwhelm of email and having to stay on top of it. You know, I write out my priorities every morning. Like what are the, the I've got my long list of things to do, but I write out my key priorities and like I try and attack those first rather than leave them till later in the day. And rather than just thinking that my job is, is replying to email, which it physically, a lot of the time it is, stay on top of those particular priorities and push those things forward, you know? Off at meetings quite a lot, going and talking to either artists about the kind of productions that they want to make, or if it's an artist that I'm involved with, working with them to structure how their career is moving forward. What kind of shows are we planning? What kind of recordings are we planning? Have we got a record deal? Do we need to go and have a meeting with the record company in order to plan release schedules, etc.? Meeting with agents to talk about the kind of shows that we're going to put together. On the record producer side, meeting with A&R people to talk to them about their artists and what kind of record producers or songwriters need to work with their artists. On the festival side, trying to figure out all sorts of schedules that have to be put together and, and managed, the kind of people that we're going to involve in the actual production of the festivals, the kind of musicians that we're going to involve. Um, recently, we had a wonderful uh, festival called One Fest that we put together at the Roundhouse that a few weeks ago won the best festival at the Independent, the AIM Awards. We won the best independent festival. This is a festival where most of the team around the festival were young people doing their first role within the festival, within the live events business. You know, we had to sort of manage those people and it was specifically set up so that those people could do that kind of role and give them an input and give them a leg into the industry. Recently, I've come off this project that we were talking about earlier, which is for Amnesty. Okay, so I put together a series of shows with So Far Sound who put on gigs in people's houses around the world. We put on major artists playing in people's houses. We had everybody from Emily Sande to Ed Sheeran, from Hot Chip to Gregory Porter, from Getz and Georgia Smith through to Group Love, Laura and Vula, and The National, from Frightened Rabbit to Above and Beyond. It was really worldwide, we did 200 major artists on the same day, September the 20th. It was called Give a Home. Go and Google it. This was, again, people buying lottery tickets to be one of the 50 people sat on the floor to watch these artists perform. Something rather special, and uh, we might do that again. But this was to raise money for Amnesty's refugee program. And that took nine months out of my life doing that. So the vast majority of the time on that particular thing was me calling up artists, calling up artist managers, and, and getting to uh, persuading them to do this particular event and finding the right kind of event for them. Um, we ended up doing 40 shows in London and 30 in New York, 30 in LA and everywhere from Chicago to Reykjavik in Iceland, from Australia to Indonesia, Tokyo, all on the same day. That took a lot of bandwidth <laughs> for me and um, amazing team of people with the SoFar Sounds and the Amnesty people. It's been an incredible, life-changing 
event for so many people. It's funny coming off the back of that because, you know, when you're so in such an intensive period and you come off the end of it, it's like your inbox goes down from 400 emails a day down to a manageable about 150. Every day is very different. I mean, every day is the same, like a shitload of email, but every day is different in terms of like different people that I'm having to relate to on different projects, putting things together. But that's me, you know, that's not a template for the music business. You know, that's me because I'm a music entrepreneur working in lots of different spaces at the same time, which I enjoy doing. And it's an, it's an adrenaline thing. You know, I go to four shows every week. I go and see live music four times, at least four times, maybe five times sometimes a week. Things that I enjoy, some of them for business, but a lot of them because I, I enjoy it, I love it. I talk at a lot of conferences around the world and I enjoy that because you get to meet a lot of people with different viewpoints. And then I advise on certain other festivals in different other parts of the world. I've been helping a guy out in Sierra Leone and we put on a festival on the beach, the Freetown Music Festival, and I helped him with that, going over again next year. Festival in Palestine, called Palestine Music Export in Ramallah. I've been helping out on that, but it's never boring. It's a six day a week job and it's pretty knackering. I mean, I get up in the morning, every morning, and I have a lump in my throat thinking, oh my God, how am I gonna get through today and what have I got to deal with next? But you know, it's like to not allow that to control you and to you know take action I think that I think for me you know I, I can't speak for other people but for me you know taking action moving things forward and not being afraid to deliver something I think a lot of people work on projects but they're terrified to reveal them to the public everybody's writing a book or everybody's been making a movie or everybody's doing this and whatever but they're terrified about actually going well here it is right I think delivery you know whether something is perfect or not, you just gotta do it, right? Get it out there, right? That goes for music, that goes for art, that goes, for, it's like, you know, don't be over perfectionist, deliver, 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 deliver. Networking is a really important aspect of my job and my life. And I'm one of those people who act as a connector between different people. I'm a great putting together of people. And that's a skill that I've learned over, you know, many, many, years. I mean, back in the day, there wasn't any, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, let alone LinkedIn. You networked by going to events and meeting people and learning the art of gently introducing yourself to people and not being obnoxious, but being straightforward. And um, I have always found that that skill, even in the digital age, is actually the real way, right? It's to be straightforward. People respect that. And, you know, when I met Travis, who I respected gratefully, who was the guy who started up Rough Trade and Rough Trade Records, Richard Branson, who was, you know, at that time had Virgin Records, but then later, you know, grew into the Richard Branson we all know and love today, astronaut Richard Branson. <laughs> These people had reputations, and of course you were like scared to sort of like go up and introduce yourself, but if you introduce yourself in a way that wasn't over the top, you'd f be surprised how often people are quite open and want to talk to interesting young people who have something to say. Now there are many fora for the possibility of meeting people. I found Twitter useful personally, you know, that's connected me with certain people and uh, groups of artists in other countries that I would never otherwise have got through to. And because generally Twitter is controlled by the artists themselves, if they notice, you know, you communicating with them in a way that's meaningful, sometimes you get an interesting response. And that's been very useful for me, especially when I was reaching out to talk about all of the projects that I've been doing with Amnesty, etc., etc. Getting out there and, and being brave, being prepared to take rejection. You know, it's like, you're not always gonna connect with somebody and a lot of the time you're gonna get no response or you're gonna get rejected, but that's okay too. Building up a bit of a thick skin is important, but not a thick insensitive skin. If I had to pick one song to describe my work ethic, there is a song that comes to mind, which is by the Average White Band, who were an, a Scottish funk band, right, of the 70s and 80s, who were huge in America. They had number one albums in America. These white Scottish guys doing James Brown style stuff, they were huge. And uh, they had a song called I've Got Work To Do.
to get out there and just roll your sleeves up and get stuck in, you know? If you're procrastinating, if you're putting it off till tomorrow, shit ain't gonna happen. And that song to me is really something. It's about like, yeah, I've got shit to do and I've gotta get on with it, I'm gonna do it, right? And uh, I really like that. I think the work ethic is very important to what I do. And I think that, you know, anybody who's really do, trying to do anything meaningful in this industry, you can't expect it to be, to come easy. It's a hard, grinding work and you have got to be completely focused on it. You can go work for somebody else and, you know, work your nine to five, you know, but if you really want to achieve something, it requires you rolling up your sleeves. As a child, I was very irreverent. I was not really manageable as a child. I was pretty unruly. I did my own thing. I was very cheeky. And I've got a 17 year old son right now and I look at myself age 17 and I can forgive you a lot <laughs> because of how I was when I was at that age. I think that if you start to ossify, in other words, you start to harden, if your arteries start to harden, if your mental arteries start to harden, if you're not open to things, if you're not open to communication, if you're not open to new experiences, if you're not open to new music, if you're not open to new ways of doing things, everything starts to like harden up. And I certainly believe in keeping the youthfulness absolute center. That openness to learning, I think is super important. And if I stop learning, I think life is over. A daily technique I found very useful. Everybody should do it and not everybody does it. Piece of paper and a pen and write down the top 10 things that you absolutely need to do today, right? And do them. And write down that list every single day. Rewrite the list every single day, right? And attack that list from the hardest one first. The one that you least want to do because you know that's gonna be the tough one. That's the one that's gonna help you move forward, right? And start from that one first. And I do that still every single day. In order to attract management clients, Literally, when I first started, I would just see people playing in venues and I would go up to them and go, have you got a manager? <laughs> and if they didn't have a manager and I was really, really keen on them, I would talk to them and try and, you know, say, you know, can we do something together? And obviously I had created a little vehicle for myself, which was this record label that I started when I was 19. So I was going to people and say, let's make a record, you know? And of course that was quite an attractive prospect for people. These days, clients come from recommendation. You know, obviously there's a bit of a brand out there that people know about that they can find and they, you know, you get approached. You've only got so many hours in the day, so you have to be really selective about how many clients that you take on. I think teamwork is incredibly important. If you're a solo operator, and I've always been a solo operator, but I've linked up then with other teams, it's always good to work with people. What's great now is co-working space. There's so much co-working space available. Just being in that environment where other people are working and you know, you're bringing yourself to that space every day, rather than sitting at your kitchen table, you're going to a space to work and be around people. That's the beginnings of something that you can create. The entrepreneur knows that they're the one who is responsible for getting shit done. You want to find like-minded people like that. A big moment of wonder for me was aged 16, standing on the side of the stage at the Watchfield Music Festival and where I'd been, you know, helping <laughs> manage this stage. Really having that moment where it was like, this is what I want to do with my life. It was like, here we were in a field. I right? stood on top of, you know, a real ramshackle stage with a dodgy PA and maybe 5,000 people out there, but we're putting on a show, you know? And it was at that moment that I thought, you know, this is really what I want to do with my life, you know? And it was really, really kind of clear. I've had those kind of peak moments again in similar circumstances, nearly always to do with like when I'm in the middle of a big show, some of the big Africa Express shows, for instance, suddenly, you know, you're there and there's just this phenomenal sea of people who are really enjoying something and you've gone through all of this unbelievable pressure to help make this thing happen. And then those moments where you realize that if you hadn't put that person together with that person, this wonderful bit of musical magic wouldn't have happened. You know, I've had lots of those. I've been very lucky with those, having number one hit records here in America quite a few times during my career. They're fleeting moments, they pass, but you know that if you hadn't made that decision to connect that person with that person, that bit of magic wouldn't have come out of it. And I've done that a few times and that really is a moment of wonder. You know, I'm very glad that I didn't allow myself to be controlled by fear. Putting fear to one side and deciding to go through it instead of hiding from it has allowed me to have this 
career has sustained me and my family for a long time. And I'm very grateful to be in this position. The people who work hard tend to get luckier. Cliche, but I believe it to be true. I'm very grateful for the career that I've had for such a long, a long period of time. Everybody thinks the music business is, you know, it's glamour, it's glitz, people are attracted to it. A lot of people are attracted to it for the wrong reasons because they think it's easy or they think it's a simple way in to sort of get reflected glory. The people who are successful in this business work incredibly hard. It's vocational. If you have a vocation, you work very hard. You know, doctors have a vocation. I'm not saying as a, that I work as hard as an NHS doctor, but I work incredibly hard. And the people who are successful in it work very hard, long hours, and put a lot of sweat in before those moments of glory and wonder occur. So a personal quote that relates to the way that I view the music industry and the way that I view artists is that art is in the soul of the artist, not in the eye of the beholder. Think about that for a second. I think that quote resonates with me particularly because it's about recognising that the artist is actually at the front of this business. You know, we're in the music business, but the music business would be totally irrelevant without the artist. And it's the artist who is the creator. And, you know, we are there to help bring their vision to the world. My name is Stephen Budd, and you have just seen and heard the wonders that got me here.